Um, an, another topic that's been uh, really a struggle for a long time, um, and I have to say, finally, we're getting some uh, some really high quality evidence base uh, data to to help guide us. Uh, is the whole issue of HPV and uh, HPV-induced um, uh, anal uh, uh, problems, including anal cancer, and the question of who do we screen, how often, uh, what tests are, are best used, how do we prevent anal cancer, how do we treat it, uh, and, to, and to help us work around some of those issues, uh, Susan Ku Uven uh, is, is joining us today as our, as our final speaker. Uh, Susan is a, a professor of uh, medicine and infectious disease at Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, and has been uh, very active in this field uh, of, of HIV medicine for a very long time uh, and is now helping lead the, uh, uh, the, the work at, at Brown University and uh, is, a, is a really great person to take us through this journey. So Susan, um, feel free to Help, help us understand this better? Well, I wish um, I could give a final answer to this. As Paul has been saying that this has been an issue that we have been trying to deal with for a long time and what to do with anal cancer screening. We are very clear on cervical cancer screening, but if you look at all the current guidelines, they're all different on what they would recommend for anal cancer screening. Uh, the question, what now? It's evolving, it's a moving target. And the basic reason for this is there's really no high quality evidence-based studies to tell us what the right screening is. Uh, so that is one of our biggest issues. So anyway, uh, the learning objectives for this session is to describe the impact of HIV epidemic on the incidence and the progression to anal cancer and the risk factors among people with HIV, particularly in the United States. List the recommendations for anal cancer screening and their limitations among persons with HIV and to describe the recommended treatment for anal high-grade squamous epithelial lesions to prevent anal cancer. So I wanna start with case one. Case one is a 45 year old person with HIV, identifies as a man who have sex with men, CD4 count of 200, plasma viral load is undetectable on combination antiretroviral therapy, no diagnosis of sexually transmitted infection in the past two years, he says he always uses a condom during sexual activity. So um, his risk for developing anal cancer compared to the general population is A, decreased because he is on combination ART with undetectable plasma viral load, B, increased because despite being on combination ART, with an undetectable viral load, he has HIV. C, similar to the general population. So I'll give you time to put in your answers. Oh, there is music. The choices are not many, so let's see. Wonderful, I don't think you need this lecture for me, uh, the majority shows that it's increased despite being on combination ART with undetectable plasma viral load. And you are correct. And really the, the incidence of anal cancer among MSM with HIV is high and it is estimated to be about 89 per 100,000 person years. And among women with HIV, the incidence ranges from 18.6 to 35.6 per 100,000 person years. In comparison, the incidence of anal cancer in the general population is 1.6 per 100,000. So you can see by virtue of having HIV alone, your 
uh, risk for having anal cancer is much higher than that of the general population, whether you are male or female, but the highest among men who have sex with men. And in a meta-analysis, the risk of progression from anal high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion to cancer was estimated to be 265 per 100,000 person years, particularly among MSM with HIV. And this is, I can tell you, this is extremely high. And the Danish data shows a five-year incidence of progression to cancer of 14.1% among persons with HIV with anal interepithelial neoplasia. All of these are much, much higher than what we would find in the general population. And this is happening despite combination antiretroviral therapy. So you chose the right answer uh, for, for the first case. The second case is a 35-year-old transgender female with HIV who is asymptomatic. Uh, her CD4 count is 150, but her plasma viral load is undetectable on combination antiretroviral therapy. She wants to know if she should be screened for anal cancer. What screening would you recommend? A, an anal pap test with HPV co-testing if it's available in your facility, in your institutions. B, go to a high resolution anoscopy and a biopsy. C, HPV testing only since HPV 16 and 18 are the most frequent cause of anal cancer or neoplasia. I'll give you time to select your answer. Okay. okay. Like I said, this is an audience that knows uh, their anal uh, cancer screening. And yes, it's anal PAP with HPV co-testing if it's available in your institution. So let's review what we know about anal cancer screening. First of all, I would like to say that, as I said before, there is no big evidence-based study that have tried to answer this question. So if you look at the New York guidelines, and I know the International uh, Anal Neoplasia Society is also revising the recommendations for anal cancer screening, um, I want for you to clearly understand that these recommendations that I'm going to talk about are proposed recommendations to the HIV OI guidelines. They are under review. They have not yet been approved and changes might be made after uh, the discussions and the review. But I would like to thank the members of the HPV OI guidelines working group we work on this for over six months, a lot of back and forth debate, a lot of looking at the literature and how much evidence we have in terms of making these proposed recommendations. I would also like to say, at the very least, all HIV uh, persons living with HIV should have a digital anorectal examination called DARE annually. So you have no excuse to say, we don't have the facility to do anal pap testing or HPV testing, high resolution anoscopies and biopsy. You have no excuse not to be able to do a digital anorectal examination every year on all your patients with HIV. So this is going to be a little bit of an explanation covering many things because when we were discussing this, we had to consider the available resources wherever you are practicing. It's easy when you're in an academic medical center 
but we have a lot of community clinics that dealing with persons with HIV and a lot of them who are MSM. So if you have access only to anal cytology testing, we would recommend you, you screen with anal cytology only. Um, persons with HIV in whom screening has been initiated uh, to have an anal cytology testing every year. And you can see that all the recommendations are B3 because there's no randomized control trial study and there's no strong uh, evidence base uh, among the literature that we could give a higher rating. If the results of three consecutive anal cytology are normal, follow up the anal cytology every three years. Persons with any abnormal cytology, anything that's equal or greater to a typical squamous cells of undetermined origin should be referred for high resolution anoscopy. Also, there is a big debate on what age do we start anal cancer screening. For our group, we think that MSM and transgender women who are 35 years and older and women with HIV and all other persons with HIV age 45 years and older should undergo anal cancer screening. If you have co-testing available in your facility, this was the one that we would favor as an anal, uh, initial anal cancer screening. Um, if co-testing with anal cytology and anal high-risk HPV testing, and all HPV testing is high-risk, should be performed, then persons who are co-test negative means that their baseline, they have a normal anal cytology and a negative HPV test. They can have their next anal cancer screening in three years. However, if the initial anal high-risk HPV testing identifies HPV 16 or HPV 16 and 18 specifically, no matter what the result of the cytology, even if it's normal, we recommend that the person be referred for high resolution anoscopy. Uh, primarily, as we said, HPV 16 and 18 cause, are the main causes for anal cancer. Almost 70 to 80% of the anal cancers are due to HPV 16 and or 18. If the anal cytology is normal and the HPV testing is positive, and if you happen to have HPV 16 or HPV 16 specific testing that is negative, then repeat co-testing in one year is recommended. If either of the co-tests at one year is abnormal, either the cytology is abnormal, or the high-risk HPV is positive, you will refer to high-resolution anoscopy. If the initial high-risk HPV test is positive, but you don't have any specific test for 16 or 18 genotype, then repeat the cytology and HPV co-testing in six months. Any positive from this test you refer for high-resolution anoscopy. How about if you have an abnormal anal cytology and you are using HPV co-testing? Like I said, if you have ASCUS on anal cytology and the high-risk HPV testing is negative, you can elect to repeat the co-testing, the cytology, and the HPV testing in one year. If either of the co-tests at one year is abnormal, whether it's only the cytology is abnormal or you have a positive high-risk HPV test, then you refer for high-resolution anoscopy. 
if ASCUS on cytology and high-risk HPD testing is positive, you refer to high-resolution anoscopy. For any low-grade ASCUS, high-grade high grade SIL or an anal cytology, you refer immediately for high-resolution anoscopy, regardless of the HPV result. So any low-grade, ASCUS high-grade, high-grade anal cytology, refer for high-resolution anoscopy. The biggest issue that we have faced is not all uh, clinics have access to high-resolution anoscopy, or even if you have capacity to refer for high-resolution anoscopy, access to that might be difficult, either because of distance, transportation, socioeconomic issues from your parent, uh, from your patients, or just the waiting time is too long. One thing that you have to remember is that even high-grade anal dysplasia or neoplasia does not develop anal cancer in six months or one year. So please refer for high-resolution anoscopy, even if the waiting time is three to six months. Within the above guidelines, if the number of people who need HRA is exceeding HRA capacity, providers may consider prioritizing referral for HRA. And who are more at risk for anal cancer? Older patients who are, have HIV, those known to be living with HIV for the longest period of time, those with high-grade cytologic abnormality, those with HPV 16 or 18 or both 16 and 18 on HPV um, testing, men who have sex with men and current smokers. So I think that this proposal, not yet approved, I want to make that clear, have taken into consideration capacities of clinics, you know, whether you have anal PAP only, whether you can do anal PAP with co-testing, whether you have access to high resolution anoscopy in your clinics or whether you have to refer to another clinic for high resolution anoscopy. I'm sure you will have a lot of questions about this, but in the interest of time, let's go to case three. You have a 50-year-old MSM with HIV diagnosed with anal high-grade squamous epithelial lesion by high-resolution anoscopy and biopsy. What treatment would you recommend? Observation only, repeat the high-resolution anoscopy every six months. B, surgery. C, Radiation treatment, D, hyfrication, which is office-based electrocautery or ablation procedure. Okay. Well, I think our audience didn't need for me to talk about it. Yes, we agree with you. It's hypercation, which is an office-based electrocautery ablation procedure. And why do we say that? We have the anchor study, uh, which gave us the answer. The anchor study was a phase three study from multiple sites that enrolled um, 2,237 um, patients with HIV uh, who were assigned to treatment, which is hyperkation, 93% of them. Some had enicimod, some had fluorouracil, um, but mainly ablation treatments. 
was the treatment that was given. So immediate treatment or observation, which they called active monitoring. And that was 2,222 patients. There was some attrition and you can see in that they, they you know, some patients, some patients uh, discontinued the intervention, some were lost to follow-up, some withdrew consent. Uh, patients died, but none of them were related to anal cancer or the study, okay? So um, this is the Kaplan-Meier um, graph that uh, was from the anchor study that shows that treatment, immediate treatment for high-grade SIL is markedly better than active monitoring, which is observation over every six months. Um, now, if you had any concerns or there were any findings during high-resolution anoscopy during the follow-up, of course, they were offered treatment. But immediate treatment made a 57% reduction in the risk of developing anal cancer. So this is a randomized controlled trial. So this is an A1 recommendation. You don't wait uh, for uh, when somebody has a high grade anal lesion or neoplasia, you refer them for treatment the soonest possible. So I think you all got the questions right, majority of you. So I'm very thankful. Uh, this is an evolving field. And I, I can see that in the next six months that many guidelines will be coming out with the recommendations. They might differ uh, at the screening age. Some will probably be 30, others will be 35. Your question probably is, you know, you have the anchor study. Did the anchor not study the best way to screen? The anchor study did HPV testing, anal cytology. However, the eligibility criteria is a biopsy of high-grade SIL based on HRA and biopsy. And HRA, of course, is not practical. We cannot send all our patients with HIV, even just the MSM alone, who are the highest risk groups for HRA. HRA. We just don't have that capacity. So we still need proof whether anal pap alone will do it, anal pap with co-testing is the best, or HPV testing alone will be able to be a better screening. So uh, that's why we have those different layers of recommendations. So Paul, I think we'll go to the question and answer session. Well, thank you, thank you uh, Susan. Uh, great uh, um, help with a very complicated issue. And I think the, the way you end it is really where uh, I, I would end a lot of the questions would like to start, which is the implementation of it. Um, and uh, we know that in the US, uh, many people uh, at risk for HIV and for its complications, including anal cancer, live in resource limited settings uh, with limited access and often in states that aren't providing generous benefits. Uh, help us uh, understand kind of if you have to implement this in a place where the resources are so limited, how, how would you start? What would you, what's the most important starting point would, would, would you recommend? Like I said, the starting point, and there's no excuse not to do it, is a digital anorectal exam yearly. It doesn't matter who, what age, as long as they have HIV, that is an easy thing to do in the clinic. Now, I say easy thing to do in the clinic, but it has to be done correctly. So there are videos uh, that will show you how to do a correct digital anorectal exam. It is uncomfortable. Patients don't like it, but it's once a year. 
Nobody wants a pap smear either. Nobody wants a mammogram. It's uncomfortable. But if you explain to your patient the reason why you're doing this, they will probably agree with you because most of our patients really want to have a healthy life. And this is just one part of keeping them healthy. My oldest patient is 86. I never thought, you know, when I started this in the 80s that I would see my patients grow old to be 86, 84, 82. Um, and we have kept them alive by taking care of a lot of comorbidities. I mean, many of our patients are living longer. Um, they are at risk for comorbidities, even if we can control their HIV. So, and then we took into consideration like community-based organizations that are in rural areas. So anal pap would be acceptable as a beginning screening for those areas. So that's why we had the recommendation of if you had anal pap only, what would you do? And then our, our choice, of course, would be an anal pap with HPV co-testing. Um, now, the reason why this is, and even with cervical cancer, where we have pap smear for 50 years now, and, you know... It's still not widely of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have decreased cervical cancer very much, but if you really look at the sensitivity and specificity of a pap smear, it's not perfect. It got better with thin prep, but I think one of the reasons why pap smear was good is because we repeated it. We constantly did it. And the natural history of progression of cervical cancer is eight to 10 years before you develop that. It, it might be shorter in patients with HIV, especially for anal cancer, but it doesn't develop overnight, okay? So even in the anchor study, uh, you have a median of 29 months, almost 29 months of follow-up. And, you know, uh, you know, the risk of anal cancer was markedly decreased in those that got treatment. Um, HPV testing, I must say to you, is not FDA approved for anal specimens, but uh, it is available in many, many institutes. Uh, Susan, uh, that raises another uh, uh, access uh, question. What about the interpretation, the pathologic interpretation of specimens? Has that been a problem? And I know that there was a lot of work in the anchor study uh, to get um, uh, those routinely reviewed. Is, what's, what's, the, what's that like in, in real practice? You know, like anything else, the reason why in the rest of the world, they're still doing visual inspection with acetic acid, with Lugol's iodine, is because uh, to do cervical cytology and anal cytology requires the infrastructure. You need a cytopathologist who has expertise in reading this. Not any pathologist will be able to do it. If you look at pathologist readings, there's variability in the readings. I think they have less problems in the high-grade SIL because it's quite obvious or it's cancer, but there's a lot of variability when it comes to atypical cells or even low-grade SIL. So you need the infrastructure. You need the machines to be able to run your thin press and to be able to do the slides for your pathologist to read it. But the most important thing is an experienced cytopathologist. The same way for a high resolution anoscopy, not any colorectal surgeon can do that. You have to have expertise in high resolution anoscopy to be able to do it. So, I, and I think you've answered this question already, but. Uh... Uh, Leslie asked whether there's any role for routine an anoscopy if, if she just can't get uh, HRA or if there's uh, a really an, a, an undue delay. Is, can you get away with routine anoscopy? That has not been studied, but if you really look <laughs> at high-resolution anoscopy, 
anoscopy. It's really anoscopy with vinegar and lugos, but the difference is you have a high resolution pulposcope. And that makes a big difference. So I think if I were in a very, very rural area, like when I go to do my studies in Bangladesh, in Kenya, you know, in the Philippines, where I have no access to colposcopy, I do it anyway uh, for high risk patients because I might not be 100%, but if I see a lesion, then at least I can biopsy. So it's a matter of access. What I don't want is somebody not to do anything because I don't have the sophisticated anal path. I don't have a laboratory that can run that. I don't have HRA or biopsy capabilities. That is a cop out. I think even with the most minimal, you know, I know that, you know, low resource countries are doing things, not the same standard of care here, but you would be surprised at how many clinics in the US are even worse than low resource countries. I mean, we assume that we have all of this, but it's not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know that there was interest, uh, Susan, uh, because obviously these issues are reminiscent of the issues facing cervical cancer screening. Yes. Um, and I know that there were uh, efforts to uh, standardize the procedure to allow um, uh, non-physician uh, healthcare providers uh, to do this uh, by video with uh, somebody at a central site reviewing the videos. Uh, is that something, how, how did that work? And is that something that could be thought of for, uh, for anal disease as well? I cannot answer that for anal disease because the studies have not been done, but certainly for cervical cancer, yes. We do a lot of telemedicine we have mobile colposcopes that you can put pictures in the cloud, can be reviewed in real time. And they are now coming up with mobile colposcopes with AI intelligence that can give you a reading in 60 seconds. Those are all advances in cervical cancer. We're not nowhere near in terms of anal cancer screening. So um, an issue has come up in the, in the questions. Uh, Okay, uh, you've walked us through this. We know that HIV patients are at high risk for anal cancer. What about uh, men who have sex with uh, men who have anal uh, exposures? Uh, certainly they must also be at some higher uh, risk even without HIV infection. Can you comment are, on, on much, that? They are, but much lower than if you had HIV infection. So does that, do you have any thoughts about recommending screening procedures for those who are taking care of men who have sex with men who aren't necessarily HIV infected? Yes, I would like them to be screened, but uh, with risk, uh, risk stratification, if we really have limited HRA resources, we have to choose the highest. The higher risk, yeah. So uh, another uh, a person on the Q&A asks about self-collected uh, HPV and anal swabs. Um, um, obviously, that's been a very important topic in a variety of situations, including STIs. Can you talk yeah. about that and how that might fit into these recommendations? Uh, we have no data to support that yet. Although in cervical cancer screening, there are many, many studies that self-collected swabs are as good as clinician-collected swabs for HPV typing. The problem with uh, anal, and even doctors who do anal path, if they are not trained well, they come up with insufficient cells. You have to go at least one inch inside the anal canal and be able to collect the right specimen. If you're just in the rectum or if you miss the transformation zone, so training has to be done too. At least the cervix, you see it. 
you see the cervix. You put the speculum, you see the cervix. You see the endocervix, you see the ectocervix. Now, when we're doing anal path, it's a blind procedure. So the more experienced you are, the better. It is uncomfortable. Even men who have sex with men, who have anal sex, they find it very uncomfortable. And so you have to be able to do a good anal path. It's not just putting the Dacron swab there right, right. and swabbing. You come out with unsatisfactory specimen, even among doctors, I can tell you that. So Sarah asks, uh, okay, uh, we understand the need for this. Can you recommend a video that can help uh, the audience um, understand this better, uh, how to yes. do these procedures. I will Go share, ahead. share with you the DARE video and uh, videos on high-resolution anoscopy. There has been a big push on training for high-resolution anoscopy for doctors who are not colorectal surgeons. And if you could um, make sure that those are shared uh, through the uh, uh, through the uh, website for this course, that would be great. So yeah. I think having some links so people could um, could could do that would be great. Uh, so yeah, what about? Awesome. Go ahead. I yeah. must say that aside from just the didactics and the videos and everything, there is a certification process, the same as you know doing cervical colposcopy. There is a certification process that goes into it. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm looking at the questions. A lot of questions about um, kind of, will, will HRSA pay for transportation and lodging? Um, what's the status of reimbursement by HRSA? I, I think that would be uh, probably especially for the Ryan White uh, programs. I have not had any problems reimbursing anal pap smears and anal uh, HPV testing for any of our patients who are HIV infected, uh, sorry, who have HIV. HIV seems to be enough uh, not to even need a pre-authorization or anything. So, and for Ryan White uh, clinics, you know, Ryan White is a payer of last resort. Um, so, you're lucky if you have Ryan White funding because we have money for transportation for help. You know, in the COVID, we use not Ryan White money, but our own clinic money, $100,000 to give stop and shop food gift cards because right. patients had no jobs. They, yeah, yeah. they had access to antiretroviral therapy uh, covered through ADAP, Ryan White, and transportation. They come to clinic, but they had nothing to eat. Yeah. So we allocated that money, and I know that not all clinics are the same, but we we look at uh, the socioeconomic situations of our patients because there's no point having an undetectable viral load with a high CD4 count if you're going to die of something else. Something else, right? So here's a question that I'm not uh, I'm not uh, so uh, sure about the details, but let me just uh, uh, read it. Apollo in uh, in Sacramento says. Uh, comment regarding narrow band imaging sigmoidoscopy for evaluated uh, for evaluating uh, abnormal test results. Um, it, nope, colonoscopy will not do your high resolution anoscopy. So they don't colonoscopy sigmoidoscopies. They they do not uh, look for the transformation zone, so they will not be able to identify anal cancer until it's advanced. Got it. So, so colonoscopy too late, too late. is not yeah. Yeah. a substitute. Uh, and then another question about uh, screening thresholds. Um, um, one person says where I work, they start screening at 25 for HIV positive. Should we push it back to 35? Um, is there something wrong well, with doing it too early? Most epidemiological studies and even uh, even the, the anchor study shows that the greatest risk starts for men who have sex with men, 30 to 35. So you will see a difference in guidelines. Some will say start at 30, some will start at 35. It's the same for cervical cancer screening. If you look at the HIV, HIV uh, match cohort, a cancer match cohort, 
uh, younger people do not really have very, very high risk for anal cancer or cervical cancer. So for cervical cancer, it's 21. And for anal cancer, based on epidemiology and what we know, it will be a fight between 30 and 35 for okay, NFM and 40 or 45 for others. Well, you've, you've done a great job in a, <laughs> obviously a complex area where there is evolving data. But finally, I think with the anchor study, we have some solid prospective data to help, to help guide us. So I think the, probably the answer is stay tuned. This is probably going to change uh, over time, but it's clear from the questions that people are seem interested, but uh, are struggling with the implementation of this with the resources. So uh, anything you can do to help uh, help the audience better understand uh, how to implement this would be would be really great. But you've done a it's a learning job. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And I want to really thank the people, uh, the anchor study, because this really pushed the envelope. Yeah. We know the treatment. You have a one recommendation for treatment, but what is your recommendation for screening? Yeah. So this is really pushing the field very fast. We have ignored it for a long time and we've been talking about it, but there was just no push because we didn't even know what was the best treatment. And I know um, the investigators worked really hard to get that uh, going and, and great yeah. support from the NIH. This, this would not have been done by a drug company, <laughs> needless <laughs> to say. So thank you very much. And I think, um, uh, I think we can now thank you and bring Connie back um, to, Thank the audience and say goodbye, Connie.